we are going to explore the role that law plays in ensuring that everyone can benefit from AI and that the harms that it could potentially create are addressed by the law. To moderate our first panel, please join me in welcoming Herbert Swanaker, Senior Associate at Clifford Chance. Thank you everyone for being here today and thank you very much to my panelists. Today we're talking about bias in the law, it's a massive topic um, but incredibly important. I think today what I would love for us to have a discussion about is how we move beyond high level recommendations in this area, so beyond just saying you need to have you know, diverse data and diverse people. I want to sort of explore with each of you your work and how we can move into a more practical space. Um, but I'll start with some brief introductions. So first we have Sandra Vakta, a professor at Oxford University's Internet Institute with too many accolades to name, <laughs> but entirely unsurprising as she's one of the most cited minds in AI. Um, Sandra, your theoretical and practical work I really respect. You make such an impact in this space. And I think also practically how you work with organizations is, is amazing as well. We have Dr. Millie Zimetta, um, I looked at your Twitter, formerly X handle, which says you're a tech policy ninja. That's right. So I will keep my wits about you <laughs> today. Um, but other than being a brilliant thinker, Millie is also formerly head of public policy at the Open Data Institute. But this does not do enough justice to the amazing advisory work that you do with organizations like Nesta, Chatham House's Digital Society Initiative, and you were recently appointed as, as an independent digital expert for the UK Competition and Markets Authority. And last, but certainly not least, Sarah Chander, Senior Policy Advisor at European Digital Rights. Sarah is one of the most influential voices in AI right now, named in Time Magazine's um, 100 Most Important People in AI this year. But also you just do work which is really shaping the law in this area particularly, so thank you for that. And looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that work today. But to kick us off, what I would love to do is hear from each of you in turn for about five minutes or so, a little bit about your work in this space and where you think we need to be focusing on AI and bias in particular. Um, Sandra, I'll start with you. And then I will go to Sarah and then Millie, if that's okay. Sandra. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you so much for the invitation, actually. And thank you for everybody who, who came out today. Um, yeah, my, my name is Sandra Wachter. I'm Professor of Technology and Regulation at Oxford, at the Oxford Internet Institute. And my, my day job is to ask myself the question of how, if at all, new technology is disrupting the law. And uh, the lucky thing about that job is that I don't have to do this by myself. I have a, a wonderful research group at Oxford that is called GET, the Governance of Emerging Technologies. And that's, that's what we care about. That's what we're excited about, is trying to figure out how we can um, harness the good that technology can do while at the same time hampering the negative consequences. And so the way that we do that is we, we often ask ourselves, you know, is, is the, what's, what's the potential risk of a technology? And then we ask ourselves, does the law pr protect us already? Because we do have a lot of laws already. Um, maybe we don't have to be worried so much. And then very often we come to the conclusion that no, the law is not well equipped. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, why that's actually the case. And then it means that we have to think about the ethical side of it. So if the law doesn't give you an answer, you have to ask yourself, what would be the ethical thing to do if the law doesn't actually give you guidance on that? And then very often we try to think about the tech side of it. So once we have an idea of what good governance looks like, we are interested in figuring out what a technology can help you achieve that. So that's the, the, the triangle approach that we have, which is also the reason why my team is extremely <coughs> diverse in terms of, of disciplines. So I, I work with tech people, uh, ethicists, lawyers, computer scientists, um, people from psychology and political theory because you really need those <laughs> different types of uh, thinking in, in order to tackle that. And this is especially true for bias um, because bias is not just a technical problem, it's a societal problem as well. And so before we talk about this in, in more detail, I just wanted to take like a, a minute or so 
to talk about what we mean by bias, like what does bias actually mean. And so I think the, the best way to think about bias is that um, very binary and definitely not perfect. There are two ways of thinking about it. There is technical bias and there is societal bias. And one does definitely inform the other, but I think it's still helpful to keep those two separate. So technical bias means that uh, the bias stems from the technology itself because something is wrong with the tech. So a good example is, for example, facial recognition software that we know is less accurate on faces of people of color than of white people. The reason why this is the case is because the data set that was used to train that facial recognition software predominantly saw white male faces. So because it's familiar with that look, it will be very accurate in detecting or recognizing uh, white male people, but less so women, and especially worse than for, for people of color and where this intersection um, uh, exists even worse than that. And so you can see that this is a problem from a tech perspective because the tech was trained on an insufficient data set. So the solution would be enrich the data set and show the algorithm different types of faces so it can recognize it in a way. Um, but that is just the type of technical bias. That's the one that is easier to fix. Um, it has a societal component as well. The societal component is, for example, how did, like, who made the decision to only train it on white faces to begin with. So there's already a bias of the people who decided how to design the system. But even worse than that, there's just data that is uh, biased not because um, of the training data because, but because it carries the legacy of past bad decision making in it. So for example, if you're, let's say, wanting to hire um, a professor at Oxford, a law professor at Oxford, and you want to use an algorithm for that, what you would do is you would feed the algorithm with historical data that you have, with historical data about people who have held those positions in the past. You would feed the algorithm with their grades and their reference letters and their purpose statements, and you would tell the algorithm to come up with a profile of that person. Um, why we're doing this is because we have you know, historical experience of good people who have done great work at Oxford in the law department, and so we want to learn from that. So the algorithm builds that profile, and then it's using um, the new candidate that is applying for a job and is comparing them. So if a person applies for a job, it's being compared to this artificial created profile. So if you look at who has held law professorships at Oxford in the last hundreds of years, this is probably somebody that is a, a middle-aged British white man. So I would have never gotten the gig. So I'm very happy that at Oxford they, they don't do that, <laughs> actually. But that shows you that, um, that the issue is not um, the tech problem because the data doesn't exist, right? Um, it's impossible to feed that information into the data set because women haven't held those positions. The algorithm cannot really learn that. So there is no tech solution for missing data in that sense. And there is no tech solution for wrong data either because sometimes there is not the problem of missing data but of wrong data. So, and criminal justice is a very good example there where we do have records um, of, for example, how often uh, people get charged with or something how often they have to go to prison, which is then being used to um, help judges during their sentencing. There's prediction software that is supposed to give an estimate of how likely it is that a person will reoffend in the future. And so um, what that prediction system does is it looks at how often a person has been stopped and searched how often a person has been charged with a crime, and if they have been arrested and actually charged with a crime, had to go to prison, how long they went for prison for. And that makes sense because you would assume, well, if you have acted badly in the past, you're more likely to do it in the future again, right? But what the algorithm doesn't know is that the data is wrong and biased and often very racist and sexist because the crime rates between racial groups is roughly the same but you're more likely, eight times likely, to get stopped and searched if you're a person of color than you're a white person. But the algorithm doesn't know that. The algorithm doesn't know about biased um, judges that just assume worse things about per people of color than white people. And so they were more likely to get charged with something, and if they have to go to prison, they will get um, higher sentences. And that is a social problem. So I don't know how you can change that with using a tech solution, because putting more biased data in the algorithm is not gonna make the decision fairer. 
it's just gonna show you a more accurate picture of the unfairness in the world. And so we have to be very careful when we think about solutionism, whether there is something you can do from a tech perspective, which sometimes you can. Facial recognition software is definitely, if you train it on better data, it will be more accurate, but it's not gonna make systemic racism less prevalent just because you fix the technology. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to think about those two things separately um, when we wanna tackle that because you have to do both. You have to fix the tech, but also the underlying social current. Thanks, Sandra. And Sarah, I might bring you in particularly because of your work structurally, right, in this space, thinking about structural issues. Um, a bit of an introduction into your work would be great, thanks. Yeah, sure. Um, also, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. I'm actually a Brit, but don't work in, in the UK, so trying to understand a little bit about the conversations, uh, especially around the AI Summit, has been a bit of a puzzle for me, so uh, wonderful to be here and to, to talk about this with you all. So, um, in the context of my work at European Digital Rights, I lead a coalition of uh, civil society who are working together to influence the EU's Artificial Intelligence Act. And a lot of what we are talking about in the context of that work, that advocacy work, is how do you reduce harm that stems from AI? How do you make sure that AI works for the people? And how do you have a framework of accountability for the increasing use of AI in all areas of public life? That's what we work on. Um, I'm often invited to talk about bias um, in, the, in the context of AI. And actually, I never do that. <laughs> I, never, um, ha I, I never have that conversation. So I think often organizers have a bit of a horrific time trying to, <laughs> to listen to what I say on panels. What I think I'll say three things um, by way of introduction. The first is when we're speaking about bias in the, in the context of AI, I actually think that the bias question is a losing game, and I much, much really prefer to speak about the concept of AI-based harms. Why? Um, bias is a really, and I think uh, Sandra really introduced this very nicely, bias is a very easily co-optable term. Essentially, it decides for us that AI um, is the solution, AI is a given, and if it is de-biased, then there will be no harm that stems from it. For the reason that Sandra said, that is a false sort of premise on the, on the first place. Uh, many harms that emanate from the use of AI, particularly in policing, but also in welfare, in the migration sphere, cannot be de-biased because they are fundamentally embedded, not just in the data, but in the societal systems that they work in. That is the first problem with the bias frame. But also more generally, discrimination and bias uh, as a concept are not the only types of AI-based harms that we need to think about in our society. The conversation on facial recognition is taking uh, Sandra's sort of example um, a little bit further. The conversation on facial recognition is a really good example of that. A lot of the conversation around facial rec recognition, a lot of the important work was how to get facial recognition to stop misidentifying me as opposed to somebody else. That's an really important work. But what that didn't speak about is why is facial recognition more deployed in areas where racialized people live, where working class people live. Um, why is that the case? And also, what about what are the harms that aren't related to discrimination from the use of facial recognition in the public space? Mm. That is a question of mass surveillance. That is a question of limiting our rights to protest. Much broader harms which come from the increasing rolling that we're doing into a surveillance society beyond whether or not the systems are very good at identifying me or you. So that's the first sort of limit of the bias frame. But secondly, there are some broader harms, I think often conversations about AI, especially from what I gather from the UK context, but especially in the EU too, are often missing. So what are the harms beyond discrimination, mass surveillance, or bias? Number one is the environmental concern of developing AI systems. I can't go into this in too much detail, but many of you have um, followed the work of Timnit Gebru and other um, really important um, thinkers in this space. Bias is one question that they identified, but is by far not the others, and is by far not the reason that she was fired from Google in, in 2020. That was for highlighting the mass consumption that, of data, the mass consumption of water, the mass consumption of energy that required to, build, to be built AI systems. And it's still a debate that we're not speaking about. 
The other type of harm is economic harm. AI systems, by definition, make social issues the sphere of the private sector and the companies that develop those systems. So we have a huge question of big tech dominance and the concentration of power in the hands of few as opposed to the many. And I think that was much, very much the theme of um, a big event that was happening yesterday. Lastly, there's a geopolitical type of question too. So when we talk about the, AI, the questions of AI harms here and how facial recognition, predictive policing disproportionately impacts racialized communities here, they also tried and tested across the world and exported here. So we have this sort of globality to the, to the structural discrimination, oppression and harm that surveillance technology is developed through, just as uh, facial recognition systems disproportionately impact people, black and brown communities in the UK, they're also battle tested by, by countries like Israel on the Palestinians. And so there's a really broader geopolitical question here, broader set of harms that often the frame of bias just isn't sufficient, isn't nourishable, nourished enough to think about um, what are the broader types of harm. I won't repeat Sandra's like, great like, framing of what, therefore why we need to be a bit skeptical of not just the bias frame, but the idea of technical debiasing as the solutions to all of that. But I would like to talk about a little bit later is what are then the solutions? What are the structural solutions to AI-based harms? And for us, that those are very much in the sphere of governance, and I'll speak about those types of um, concerns that we can raise. <coughs> How do we bring structural governance solutions to the use of AI? And that involves, in some way, legislation, limiting the uses of AI in many cases. How to make an accountability framework for the AI that will be used and developed. And also, how do we, um, as people involved in the policy space, empower the people that are affected by AI systems to challenge those systems? Not just to tweak them or make them better, but actually to fundamentally challenge the, the premises of why these systems are used and whether they should be continued to use in the first place. So I'll stop there and we can probably go into a little bit more about governance later. Thank you so much. And many, just briefly, it would be great to hear from you as well and thinking it, and then we can move into a bit more of an open discussion about the impacts of the law. Thanks. Yeah, sure. So um, thank you for those really helpful overviews and introductions. So I'm doing some work with Nesta at the moment. Nesta is the UK's innovation foundation. Foundation. We've just published a kind of explainer of AI. So if you go onto LinkedIn and Twitter, we post it there as an open document that you can comment on. And it talks about the role of data, including data gaps and kind of you know bias in how AI models are created that lead to this outcome where you get biased um, AI outcomes. Um, I do want to tell a bit of a good news story though. So I came to be working in tech from academic philosophy. 10 years ago, I was a lecturer in philosophy, and my, I did my PhD in philosophy of art. So I had run away from science from school onwards. I had no interest in it, was glad to get away from it. Um, but I was leaving academia, and I heard that if you are on LinkedIn, you look modern, which was really important if you've done ancient Greek, right? So I thought, okay, you know, like I'd better, better look modern. Um, so I set up a LinkedIn page. At this point, I had a computer that was so old it had a floppy disk drive. I still have that computer. I'd never used a laptop, didn't own one, never used a smartphone, didn't own one. So I thought, okay, here I am on LinkedIn being modern. I set up my profile, and the algorithm immediately started recommending jobs for me at Google. This came as a surprise to me, and as you can imagine, it came as a surprise to most of my friends. But what the algorithm had done was it looked at my skill set. It had looked at the kind of the technical background that I had in philosophy, and it had joined the dots between what was emerging now in AI. So for example, my master's dissertation had been on emotional responses to fictional characters, and I'd done a chapter on video games. This was because Lara Croft had just emerged in Tomb Raider, and I was so astonished that everyone was so interested in her. So why are people feeling emotions? I thought it was emotions towards Lara Croft. So there was a chapter in my master's dissertation. <laughs> and then I had this PhD on thinking about how we solve metaphor as a kind of logical problem, and then there's a chapter on jokes, because jokes are a logical problem. That's what it's like in academia. You know, so I had all this really interesting stuff on philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, but all rooted in my interest in the arts. But these are exactly the problems we're seeing now with generative AI. Can generative AI, can AI understand jokes? Can it create jokes? Can it create characters? I was ahead of the curve, but I didn't know that. The algorithm on LinkedIn knew what was happening in terms of what people were being recruited for and put me forward for things. And that was a game changer for me, right? That made me, in, in a way, it kind of overcame what I would call unconscious bias around gender or race or around background and made me see there was a, an area I could work in that I hadn't considered that most people wouldn't think I was an obvious match for. So definitely my interest in digital tech comes from 
How can we use it to make a better world? I have experienced that, and I really want to make that the case for others too. So it's, it's not just that I, I didn't have that immediate experience of bias. I had the opposite. I had the experience of AI overcoming forms of bias and opening opportunities that societal bias would not have made available to me, including my expectations of myself. So I'll just park that there, and I, I think that's really important we acknowledge those good news opportunities and think about how to make the most of them. But just in terms of the data gaps and all the other things we're talking about, so some work I did for um, the Lacuna Fund, I was on their technical advisory panel. Lacuna Fund was a funder collaborative set up um, by funders such as you know, Wellcome Trust, Rockefeller Foundation, Google.org and others. And it was about addressing the gaps in health data um, around health AI, specifically racial gaps, gaps around who's represented in health data around the world. So it's about making sure that there was a kind of counterpoint the data gaps around African people for global health, but also in Western nations, black communities in Western nations and the, the data gaps around them, because that's going to impact the health AI that's developed off the back of that. And part of what they were trying to do was help fund the creation of those data sets to start to address those gaps, right? Exactly, because you're not going to get better AI until the gaps are addressed. But the scale of the gap, I mean, it's, I think in genomic research, um, 86, around 86% 86 of genomic research is conducted on the genomic data of 12% of the population, of the world's population, which is, you know, white Caucasian. That's a huge gap. And that's going to affect us all because the medicines that are developed aren't going to be equally applicable to everyone, which means that public health globally is a risk, as we've seen with the COVID pandemic, no one's safe until everyone's safe. I'd also point out that maybe some of the kind of new cures and new treatments and so on, the secrets then might lie in the genomes of people who are not currently represented in genomic data, so we're all missing out. So I'd put it beyond just, okay, this is bad for the communities that are affected, this is bad for everyone. Thanks, Mitty. And I think with that, I'd like to come to you, Sarah, to talk a little bit about the law. I know you've been heavily involved in the EU's AI Act and sort of the process to coming to new legislation there. Um, we're at a crucial point where we're coming towards you know, the finishing mark. Are you optimistic about the type of legislative approach that Europe is pursuing? And how do you think this sits with this discussion that we're having on bias and fairness? Yes, so optimistic, yes and no. So op optimistic, I'll tell you why. The EU's framework, because I think it came about so much earlier than a lot of other conversations around AI, was in some ways immune to the hype around generative AI, in some ways immune to a lot of the sort of what I think are really unhelpful conversations about what are the AI-based harms. Um, when ChatGPT, uh, was it four or three, was released and the sort of boom, like everything in the world that was all everybody was talking about, the EU AI Act had already been sort of a little bit boring for us working on it by that, by that time, to be honest. It had been in, in under play and being negotiated for at least two years by that point. And so what that did was allow us to actually have a conversation about um, structural discrimination, not bias, about... Okay, so what are the high-risk use cases of AI uh, in policing, in migration control, in welfare? It allowed us to actually have those types of conversations and frame actually how would you regulate the conversation in that way. Therefore, we had what I would consider now um, quite radical conversations about banning some sorts of use cases of AI, about really structural forms of accountability, so require huge public databases just telling us actually where AI of certain types is being used, which I think is a big, for example, I think is a big concern here too. Uh, we are seeing, I think just last month, a conversation about the Department of Work and Pensions using an AI system to vet uh, welfare um, recipients uh, for fraud, for, like, for proposed fraud. It was not clear whether or actually or not this system was being used mm. and on what terms. Mm. The EU debate would actually solve that because AI and welfare is a high risk use case and there is a public database by which providers, so companies developing, but also deployers, government institutions deploying, would actually have to put a certain set of information about that use case on the database. This would solve sort of like what I see is like years, sometimes months, but sometimes even years of civil society, journalists, organizations like mine, just trying to understand the basic facts of these decision-making systems in these really sensitive areas. So it seems that you think a part of the solution is transparency in terms of people knowing through databases, for example. Transparency, yes. And that is a complicated question. Yeah. So AI, the AI 
debate is often about transparency inside the system, right? Like breaking the black box, and we've heard that many times. Let us just understand how the AI system works, and then we, that will solve all of our problems. I think there's a much broader question about how are public authorities, how are large companies using AI in the first place, before we even get to the question of how the AI system works. I think that takes us down a bit of a tangent. But first of all, where are such systems used, and how do they impact people? There's two very basic questions. The EU AI Act does tackle those types of issues. So that's where some sort of optimism comes from, at least in terms of that sort of framework. And just to recognize that was sort of the result of many, many sort of civil society, diverse sort of civil society involvement to push it in that direction. Why I'm not optimistic, I think, is because I, there is a sort of ongoing tendency, and I think it's a cynical tendency, I think it's somewhat of a delusional tendency, to think about risks in a very vague way and in a way that follows the agenda of uh, tech companies who are the very same companies that have an interest in these large models, uh, foundational models, general purpose AI, however you would like to call it, there is a large conversation about the legitimate harms of those types of systems. Again, infrastructural, environmental, economic concentration. But there's also a huge conversation about existential risk, which I think is driving a lot of the policy and legislative debate in the US and in the UK. So in that context, I am not optimistic in the sense that we are not, we're talking about speculative harms and conveniently avoiding a conversation about the harms that we're seeing already happening throughout Europe, in the UK, we're avoiding, a, like, I think, a good faith conversation about how to mitigate those types of harms. Thank you. And I might bring Sandra in um, just on this point about, you know, what's the situation right now? And I was really curious about some work that you did where you were thinking about how AI creates novel harms and it raises a question whether our existing equality laws are right at their core or fit for purpose to protect against these new kinds of risks. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that work, and then Millie would be good after Sarah's response to talk a bit about exclusionary impacts as well. Thanks, Sandra. Yes, so um, I think it's a really important question because the thing you don't want to do is reinvent the wheel if you already have a good framework in place that can mitigate some of the risks that you're concerned about. And so I got interested in the question of whether non-discrimination law can help us with that because that law has been around for, 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 for decades now and it deals with discrimination. It deals with discrimination based on gender, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, age, religious beliefs, ability, those types of things. And so at first when I started doing this work, I thought, yeah, that, why not just apply that? That shouldn't be a problem. Um, unfortunately, I came to the conclusion that the law is completely breaking down when it comes to AI. And that's not the fault of the technology nor the law. It's just a very unhappy marriage that the, that the technology is behaving in a way that the law didn't anticipate. So a very simple example is that um, non-discrimination law is, is based on a complaint-based system. <coughs> so that means that if you feel that you have been harassed or you've been fired when there wasn't a reason for it or somebody's being promoted over your head, you feel the injustice and you go and complain, which makes perfect sense in a human-human setting. The issue with algorithms is that they discriminate behind your back without you being aware of it. So that means as soon as you open your laptop or you fire up an app on your cell phone, the algorithm is learning things about you. It's learning your sexual orientation, your ethnicity, uh, your gender, gender identity, and is tailoring the world to you. And that means that you might get excluded from seeing certain opportunities there was a case in Facebook a couple of years back where they allowed advertisers to exclude people of color, uh, women, people living with disabilities from seeing certain job advertisements, advertisements for housing and financial services. They couldn't see that because they have been filtered out, but they didn't know. They didn't know that they have been profiled and they didn't know that they're not seeing the same opportunities that other people are seeing. So if I don't know that I'm missing out, if I don't know that other people get better treatment than I do, a complaint-based mechanism is not gonna be helpful anymore, right? So that's the one thing. The second thing is that AI is really good at what it's called proxy discrimination. So that means it finds correlations between uh, data points where people would never think that there is some type of connection. Only correlation, not causation. It's really, really important. So a classical example is that if I told you that I'm 
banning headscarves from the workplace, you would immediately understand that this is in conflict with free religion because we understand um, what headdress stands for and its connection to religion. So if I ask you during a job interview what your favorite color was, would you think that's a problematic question? You might think it's odd, but it's not the same uh, problem as if you think about headdress, for example, right? You might say it's a weird <coughs> question to ask. So what you might not know is that in the, uh, in the 18th century, uh, there was now absolute debunked research. I'm gonna emphasize it one more time. Pseudo research, not valid research, where bright people did think that if your favorite color is red or green, you're gay. It's nonsense, it's absolutely nonsense, but there was a point in time where smart people did think that there is a connection between favorite color and sexual orientation. AI is similarly stupid in that <laughs> sense. It finds correlation between data points where no connection exists, but for some reason they come up at the same time. And so AI could find a correlation, not causation, between favorite color and sexual orientation. And so you go to a job interview and somebody asks you, what's your favorite color? And you say red and you might not get the job. But again, how will we prove that in court? Because you cannot make the same connection anymore that you would do with headdress and religion. Last point is that AI groups you in ways that don't make sense to a human being. So if you think about non-discrimination law, the people that you want to protect usually, that leads back to ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, religion, because those are things that those are people that are and still are um, disenfranchised in our communities, and so therefore we want to have laws that protect them. And so for some reason we think it's important to group people ac according to their sex or gender, their ethnicity, but algorithms find it interesting to group you according to completely different things. So for example, if this is a tip for free, uh, if, you, if you're applying for a job at some point and you're sending in your online application, I would recommend to you that you do that by using either uh, Firefox or Chrome. Do not use Internet Explorer um, or Safari. If you use Internet Explorer or Safari, you're more likely to get rejected from the job. That's a mad idea, isn't it? If you applying for a loan, right, the speed at which you scroll for the online application has an impact on whether you get the loan or not, right? But fast scrollers and Internet Explorer users are not people that are protected under the law. That'd be crazy, of course. But now those groups are suffering similar consequences because AI just groups you in a way that people would never group you as for some reason that we can't really understand. And so we're in a situation where the disenfranchised communities are being discriminated even more but new types of harms are also coming to the scene where the law just doesn't have any provision for it. And so again, this is not a failing of the law. How could the law anticipate that your scrolling speed will have an impact on whether you get a job or not? That's not something you could anticipate, but it's just the way that technology has grown. And so now it's the important issue of, of policymakers to say, okay, we need to update that law in a way because the harm is still the same. It's just delivered differently. So is it updating or is it creating new laws? Um, I think it's updating. It's updating just to think about that. Um, the, yeah, because the harm is still the same. You're still being disadvantaged. It's just like you need different types of mechanisms to detect it and prevent it. And so the, the perpetrator has changed and the mode of delivering the harm has changed, but the harm has remained the same. So non-discrimination is a fantastic law. I'm a big fan of that law. It just means that judges need to think about harm differently. And it just means that we need more than a complaint-based mechanism. We need more, I, I get your point of transparency. Transparency is never just a solution, but we need more testing and that testing needs to be published somewhere so we can show that there is no or less bias there because I can't actually know anymore. And so it just needs an updating um, in that way, for sure. Thank you. Millie, I think it's an opportune moment to have a bit of a discussion about data and how that links into AI. 
Yeah, may I just respond to something Sandra said about creating Please. categories of dis Please. discrimination? I mean, I think that's absolutely right. And, you know, AI is often talked about in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, a new kind of industrial revolution. But the last industrial rev revolution created forms of discrimination, right, that we still have today. And in many cases, it created the category of disability if you use the social model of disability. So medical impairment is just an impairment. But what makes it more of a disability or not is the extent to which it can be accommodated. So even just thinking about the British Library, um, a wheelchair user here at the British Library probably has a lot more autonomy than they would if they're trying to use a research library, say, like the Bodleian at Oxford, which doesn't have ramps and so on. So the medical impairment has stayed the same, but the architecture has given them more or less autonomy, right? So the, the, the last industrial revolution, by standardising processes and products, it excluded a lot of people and created disabilities. And I think we're seeing that now with a lot of internet stuff. So, for example, I have a vision impairment, and I put on the high contrast setting on many websites. Often they're just not coded very well. So entire pages or buttons can disappear. So I can't click things because they're not appearing on my screen. So I can physically I can see, <laughs> but the website has removed a function from me. It's created a kind of disability, which is not the same thing as the medical impairment, right? So I, I completely get that on new kinds of discrimination and bias, which are not yet legislated for. Great. Thanks. And I, I think I wanted to talk a little bit, perhaps this factors into it. We've spoken before about the concept of data equity. And I think, of course, we have laws that already exist or that are being developed that regulate concepts or principles like fairness. But to move the discussion forward a little bit, it would be really good to hear from you what data equity means to you and how that should factor into this kind of discussion that we're having right now. Yeah, so we're having a discussion about legislating and regulating around, uh, around AI. And we think about that kind of legislation or regulation in terms of products and services, you know, the way we regulate or legislate for other things, like is it safe, can we use it, and so on. Um, and we're thinking about AI in those terms, about regulating it for safety, reliability, and so on. But there's no equivalent legislation or regulation around data, about whether data is fit for purpose, whether it's safe to use data in certain ways, whether data is of good enough quality or not. I think the legislation and regulation we have is around privacy, so thinking about whether data is sensitive or discloses confidential information, and to an extent, commercial sensitivity or national security sensitivity. So it's all about the privacy of the data, but not about the quality of it. So are there gaps in the data? Is this data appropriate for the thing that you're trying to use it for? That concept doesn't exist, at least not in, in, in the Western world. So in the UK, we're still currently under GDPR, which is the European um, regulation. Um, GDPR has its, its provenance as both an individual um, right and as a consumer right. It was about individual consumers having privacy and control over how, how data about them was being used. So it's really not fit for purpose for thinking about things like, um, say, collective harms and benefits or thinking about just being excluded from certain things and so on. Sorry, um, can you just clarify collective harms? What do you mean when you say so, so when an entire group is all having the same experience rather than just you protesting about, oh, this was not fair to me, but actually there's a whole community that are being affected in the same way, that collective experience. But it also means that emphasis on, on individualism and on commercial considerations means that we're, we're thinking about this data as a, as a commercial product, where some of the use cases could be good for society or important for society, like the public health considerations I was thinking about before, you know? So I think that we, I think the, the, the culture that we have in, in, in the West and the legislation and regulation that's being built off that maybe isn't going to help us with the kind of the future challenges we're going to have. I mean, personally, I think that we should also be looking at the global south, though, again, thinking about African cultures, they tend to be quite collectivist, and I think that's true of other regions in the global south. Um, thinking about Ubuntu ethics, um, I think Sabelo Malambi at Harvard has been doing some stuff on this. Thinking about that collective aspect again, Ubuntu ethics has at the key, at the heart of it, considerations of impact on the environment, impact on society, and that joint decision making, which would be so different from the kind of commercial AI use cases that we have now that have emerged from the West. Thank you. Sarah, I'd love to talk a little bit about your recent work where you mobilised, I think it was around 150 civil society organisations. <laughs> demanding for greater transparency through databases, so the conversation we're having earlier, um, but also thinking about legal redress. And I think in terms of the law, that's one area, and I'm interested if others have views as well, where you think we need to do more work or whether you think the existing framework is, is good. Thanks. Yeah, so um, the, the work that we did was, um, again, around the EU's AI Act, and what we tried to do, I think very similar to what Millie has just told us, is try to think about the harms, not just in an individual sense, but also in a collective sense, in terms of looking through the lens of 
are certain marginalized communities disproportionately impacted by certain uses of AI, but also in terms of broader collectivity in terms of societal harms. And basically what we did was say, uh, bringing together digital rights organizations with racial justice organization, LGBT rights, disability rights, a broad range of civil society to say, can we, can we like, have a common ground of what we want this legislation to include? And so that's what we did. Um, the main, I always say that the, the, like the things we asked were, for were three categories of things. Number one, we would think that some forms of AI should be harmed, so, uh, should, uh, so harmful that should be banned. Um, and that includes the use of facial recognition in the public space, the forms of leading to forms of mass surveillance, predictive policing, which decide you or a certain group um, or a certain location is inherently more crime um, more crime is there than in other areas, but also use, uh, uses like uh, emotion recognition, biometric categorization. There are a list of sort of well-researched use cases that we saw that were already posing harm, already structurally discriminatory, but also other types of harm across Europe using examples. And we said, I don't think these types of systems can be fixed. They can't be de-biased, they can't be technically tweaked. Uh, they cannot be improved by sort of telling more people about them and having public forums. They simply cannot be salvaged, and so they should be prohibited. And that was the first category of things we asked for. The second was a little bit more sort of uh, complex to define, but it was the accountability framework. So we said, for those types of other types of systems that shouldn't be banned, but still pose some sorts of risks to, AI, to, to people in society, like uh, with Sandra's example in hiring, these are high risk use cases. And actually the public should know more information about those types of AI systems. So there should be information, baseline information about these types of systems in a database. If I'm a welfare uh, recipient in a, a borough of London, I should actually have access to some basic information, the fact that that borough is using AI to, to, to decide if I'm a fraud, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm posing a likelihood of fraud or not. But also, if I'm a government institution that's deploying a high-risk type of use case, I should actually have to go through a series of loopholes before I deploy that system. So I should have to be asked, does my system violate the rights of people? Does it comply with the law? Does it structurally discriminate against certain groups or not? And if so, what is my plan to mitigate those harms? These are the sorts of things that we, we push for in our accountability framework. The last category of things was how do you empower the people affected? So what, one positive thing about the EU AI Act is it does try to give more information to people that are impacted by AI systems, including requiring that you are notified if a decision or outcome about you is generated that impacts your rights, but also that you should have a right to challenge um, a decision and outcome by an AI system if that has impacted your rights um, in any way. So those are the three categories of things that we've been asking for in the AI Act, and a lot of it is about the concept of collectivity, the reason we came up with these recommendations is that some things that we want are to some extent covered in existing law, like discrimination law or like data protection law, but other things are, are not. <laughs> so this notion that actually uh, discrimination law or data protection law might help us with the fact that when I go to a protest, I might be identified by a facial recognition camera and that information might be, but might be kept by the police for 10 years or so without my consent, without that type of harm, that, that, that spiraling into mass surveillance that we are seeing happening cannot be mitigated. And that is a, not just an individual harm to me, but it is a collective harm to certain communities that have negative examples, negative experiences of over-policing, <coughs> negative experience of structural violence through the police, but also on a societal level. Do we want to live in a big brother society? And so those sorts of types of recommendations that we came up with try to understand those different levels of collectivity versus individualism, which I think is something that we really need to take into account when we're talking about regulation into the AI. It's not, ne it's not necessarily about individual-based harms. Yeah, and it sounds like it's you know, moving away, as you've said before, from a purely technical lens at looking at AI issues and thinking about the societal context too. Sandra, I might come to you next just to talk about some research that I think it was with Brent Mittelstadt and um, Chris Russell that I was reading about. Um, and th there was a headline which said something like, medical systems disproportionately fail people of color, but a focus on fixing the numbers can actually lead to worse outcomes. 
Can you just tell us a little bit more about that work? Then? Yes, so yeah, we, we have been working on, on the question how to test for bias, um, <coughs> mitigate bias for, for a long time. And so the best way to think about it is that you have a system and you can figure out how biased it is by trying to compare accuracy rates across groups. You can measure that, and then the second step is you can do something about it to change it. That sounds very complicated. I try to break it down in a more human understandable way. So let's say that you have an algorithm or algorithmic system that you want to use to detect skin cancer, right? So we know for a fact that uh, systems that are, have been developed um, work very well on, on, on white skin because it's easier for the algorithm to detect darker spots on, on, on white skin. It's much harder for the algorithm to detect darker spin, uh, dark spots on darker skin. And again, thinking about what had happened, technology wasn't born that way, right? It was made that way. And the predominant focus was on white skin and it wasn't on darker skin. So we have this problem now that the system is less accurate on people of color. And you might have a situation that you have a cancer detection system that is, let's say, 90% accurate for white people, but only 60% accurate for people of color or black people. Let's say black people, it's easier. It's black people. <coughs> and so um, you have those two groups. And what the problem is that tech, well, how tech people define fairness or unfairness. So a tech person would say, well, this is 90, this is 60, 30%, that's the unfairness, 30% <coughs> gap between those two groups, and that is how I define fairness, the, uh, the difference between accuracy rates between those groups. And that sounds plausible at first. And then the second step after you measure that is trying to get rid of that gap. So a sensible person, person would say, well, let's lower that gap and do this, right? Bring 60 up to 90. What an algorithm does, it's doing this. Why is it doing that? Uh, because algorithms choose the path of least resistance. It's much, much easier to break something down <laughs> to be on the same level than try to increase accuracy for another group. It's just easier. But the algorithm is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It's not failing because the prompt was make two numbers equal. That's how you define fairness. The unfairness at a 30%, and what you should be doing is make two numbers be equal. So for the algorithm, 90 and 90 is the same fairness as 60 and 60. It's just for humans where it's not, right? And so you have those systems that are being used um, and often sold to people to say, de-bias your algorithm, make it fair. And technically it is fair because now it's very bad for everybody equally. <laughs> technically that's fair. It's just humanly <laughs> abhorrent. And so we have to be really, really careful when we just take tech solutions and say, well, not a system is really fair. And really, really important to think about this interdisciplinary because if you tell a lawyer or an ethicist, they're like, what are you doing? Of course that's not fair. So we really need to, to think about that tech solution. And then we showed that with our research that it actually starts to level down. And therefore it's a disservice for uh, the people who are already discriminated against because their accuracy rates are not going up and others are being brought down for no reason whatsoever. So that's just, yeah, very, very important to keep in mind. And building on that, Millie, I might bring you in. Um, so very practically, we've spoken about data equity. If we could have AI fairness without data equity, you know, so for example, with statistical methods and thinking a little bit about this technical distinction that Sandra's just been making, would that be satisfactory? I mean, it needs to be better statistical methods than those. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so let's say that there was a way of kind of, you know, using statistics, using, you know, developing an AI system that actually ra raised both. Would that be, would that be satisfactory? I'm, I'm going to say no. So one reason is, even though the outcome is fair, I think I'd say the foundation isn't robust. If you could get that without data equity, the, the foundation wouldn't be robust. So um, I'm a member of the, um, here in the UK, we have the Office of National Statistics, the ONS. Um, that does the, the, the 10 yearly census. And I'm on the advisory committee for inclusive data, which is about everyone should be counted. And one of the discussions we have is being counted isn't passive, you know? And the idea that being counted is passive, I just think it's a residue of the surveillance capital that, that you mentioned, this idea that like, you know, kind of tech companies hoovering up data. So actually being counted should be a dialogue between data subjects and the government, between the Office of National Statistics, between data collectors about what the data's for, how it's going to be used, so everyone has a stake in the outcome. 
So I think that data equity, if you see that not just as a kind of um, a step to, to an outcome, but actually valuable in its own right, then you see why if you could get AI fairness with statistical methods without data equity, that's still not the right outcome. I either. just want to make sure that I'm clear for me, Melly, but particularly also Sandra and Sarah. Do you think there is a role, though, for technical tools to be able to assist with issues around bias and fairness? Or is it like a hybrid, so we need to all be involved, merely to your point, in sort of the accountability aspects, Sarah, too? Yeah, you need, you need to do both, right? So with, with the example that I brought, so the, the, the tools that we yeah. have developed is basically, um, it's, it's on GitHub if anybody's interested in this. Um, but we developed a tool that lets make sure that you're not leveling down. So it's putting a break in it so that doesn't actually happen. But the problem is that technically that's unfair now, right? Because you're keeping a, uh, a disparity there. Well, even though like what we, what we did is like bring this up and make sure the other one doesn't go down. But that mathematically that's still unfair. And you need to have a really good dialogue around that to understand that not harming everybody equally is not a good solution in that sense. And it doesn't sell us as much. But that doesn't change the fact that why the accuracy rates are disparate to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. And the accuracy rates are, again, problematic because the data that we have is biased, right? We have very, very poor health data from communities of color because of a racial structure and the racism that we have in our society. So if you want to have better data, you need to work with it as well, as well with the tech. You can't just do one or the other. Yeah. Well, I think to close this incredible discussion, and thank you for, for making the space and time to talk about it, um, I want to ask each of you in turn in a minute or so, um, just to give me your one thing you would encourage policymakers, lawyers, deployers of AI systems to interrogate and prioritize practically when thinking about these issues. I'll start with you, Sarah. Um, there's not just one thing, but I, I would say Number one, have a broad, detailed, sort of informed understanding of harm and not a speculative one. So think about the harms that are happening now and think about the structural solution to those harms. Is AI even part of the equation? Mm -hmm. So to answer your question earlier, do technical tools have a role? <laughs> yes, but only if you've accepted that AI should be used in that context. And for the most case, we do need to have as, as informed citizens, as a civil society, as policymakers, the question about is AI the best use of our resources? Who does this harm? Who does it benefit? And what is the question of interest there? In many cases, and why I would say technical solutions are not the right um, question, is that in many cases, the introduction of AI is about a political question of the using of resources to develop and deploy AI systems, which are primarily governed and controlled by the private sector. So again, this is questions of austerity. This is a question of structural discrimination. This is a question of power. So unless we're addressing those issues, there is almost no point of talking about technical tools. Mm. We need to talk, talk about those underlying social or political issues first. Thank you. Millie. Um, so my interest in tech comes from that early experience when I wasn't looking for a tech, but tech found me, right? So I, I, I think I'll just say, like, I just don't think we're being ambitious enough. All this discussion about preventing harms and kind of like the impact of discrimination, that's the limited ambition. I'm interested in tech that undoes the structural discrimination that we have. So it's not just about preventing it from being replicated in the tech. If we're saying this technology is so transformative, then let's be transformative. Let's transform. Let's transform. Thank you. Sandra, to close. Yeah, I think the, the, the thing would, which I would like to policymakers to um, consider is that they stop believing in that rhetoric of how can we make AI obey our values? How can we make AI um, be as we want it to be and adhere to the, the values and, and, and the, 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 the things that we have in our society we want to protect? That because that's a, that, that the narrative assumes that this is a thing that exists out of our control. It's like an alien that lands on our planet, and now we have to negotiate that it adheres to our rules and laws. That's not how it is. That thing didn't land here. 
It wasn't born that way. It was created that way. And so when we now ask, what can we do about the bias? Like, what, why, why is it biased to begin with? Like, it's not born that way. It's a problem because the people who built it were biased because the data was biased. It's not explain, it, it can explain itself because you built it that way. It leaks data because you didn't put enough resources in to make it secure enough. Like, it wasn't born that way. It wasn't made that way. And then it also shifts away the responsibility. It's like, oh, look at that alien. What can we do with it? No, well, you made it that way. And it's yours to... Uh, fix and it's yours to own in reality because thinking about ethics should start from the first day that you open the door to your lab and start doing stuff with tech. This is when you start needing to think about those values and not when the, the genie's out of the bottle and trying to mitigate the risk that way. Sandra, Millie, Sarah, thank you so much. Really have appreciated this conversation. Thank you. Thank you.